Okay, everybody. Uh, assemble the panel today, which is uh, uh, Mike Sore, Sean Graham, Deanna Ferrari, and we, these are uh, half of the podcast organizing team this year, and they are all experts in their respective uh, uh, podcast uh, or, uh, digital tool niches, right? So they're they're um, they're here to. Uh, I'm going to let them introduce themselves, talk about what they do, and then um, talk about how. What it means for them to build their digital toolbox. Then feel free to answer questions. So how I want to do this is you know, we'll let them introduce themselves, talk about it for a minute, and then I think we'll go. And then we'll like, start to talk about questions and we'll continue the conversation. Um, one final thing is uh, if you're interested in attending the podcast this year, it's October 27th and 28th uh, at Point Park University downtown. And registration open today. So uh, if you want to go to podcast.com, they can uh, register there. Registration is free, uh, or you can uh, register as a VIP and help support the event as well. So, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Mike Sword. Me first. Uh, well, basically, I'm a, I'm a independent uh, uh, guy. Uh, I do Sorgatron Media is kind of the banner that I do all my work under. Uh, I mostly specialize in video. Uh, uh, kind of get involved with podcast and everything, doing some podcasts, which I still do. I've actually been doing a uh, show called the Wrestling Mayhem Show for uh, nearly seven years now. At the end of the year, um, and that's uh, uh, spun me out to other things. I do a tech podcast. I do a video game podcast. But those are pretty much just my flavors of love there. Uh, but they're kind of my show pieces, and they're how I kind of get out there and uh, and get other projects. Like I work with the Pittsburgh Foundation with a uh, news magazine show for nonprofits called Unsung. Uh, to try to help that community, and uh, and that's a show piece on uh, Pittsburgh on Video dot org. Um, I also do uh, uh, some social media and video work for a uh, uh, practice out in uh, Export, a psychiatry and holistic practice, uh, amongst a few other uh, kind of odd jobs and projects that happen. Um, and uh, I'm also again with Toolbox right away, or we're going to come back to that. Toolbox. All right. How's, how, can everybody hear okay? Because it's, it's sort of it's noisy up here. Bit, yeah, the fish what make a lot of noise. Um, <laughs> as Norm said, I'm Sean Graham. And uh, a quick show of hands, how many people have been to PodCamp in the past? Okay, great. Uh, so, so I think you'll see a lot. For those who have been there before, uh, I think we'll be interested to hear your thoughts and, and perspectives on it. But uh, but as Norm said, you know, I think we got some really exciting stuff in stores this year. Um, I, I work with small businesses around their marketing and brand strategies as a consultant, and um, I also am a blogger for Fast Company Magazine, uh, so you'll usually see me doing one or two things, um, but uh, it's, you know, the thing that I, I get excited about is, is uh, having a chance to, um, there, there's so many, there's so much information out there, there's so much technology, it's hard to really know, you know, which way to go, and, and, and as I work with clients, and as I also talk to these guys, um, you know, I get excited to just sort of come together and have a chance to sort of, you know, brainstorm, talk about some of the new stuff. Uh, I'm sure uh, Mike wants to talk about the iPhone 5. Uh, but uh, so I'm really looking forward to, uh, to tonight's discussion and, uh, and answering whatever questions you have. So. Okay. Hi, I'm Deanna Ferrari. I was on a PYP panel like six months ago, so I'm sorry. If I'm repeating myself, just stop me. Uh, from what you heard last time. But hopefully tonight we'll talk more PodCamp. Um, so I just got a new job. I'm a PR professional for Gebbin Communication, and it's based in Columbus. So I'm working remotely from Pittsburgh, which is pretty cool. I get to work from home, which is really nice. I don't have to do the Parkway East anymore every day. Um, so I do a mix of PR, social media, work for a variety of tech startup clients, um, nonprofits, that type of thing. And um, so for PodCamp, I'm helping with PR and publicity because we've never really done traditional PR, I guess, in the past for PodCamp. I've never been on the committee before in the past. I've just attended. So I'm trying to help out this year and gain some momentum and, um, and that type of thing. So I'm really excited. And I'm actually helping at the back end of the blog for our PodCamp blog with our community contributors, so helping people get their guest posts up, which is funny because that's what I'm hoping to get out of this year's PodCamp is more help on my own personal blog at the back end because I don't understand a lot and I could be really doing more with it, but I just don't understand. So so that's my uh, little spiel. So do we want to leave? 
lead off with a question or something? Um, uh, yeah, I guess so. Um, so this uh, kind of uh, my toolbox is it's a little bit of everything. Again, I kind of have a focus in video and trying to get people involved in it. Uh, I mean, the first thing I think about when we, we're doing some one of our productions, especially if it's a live recording, is what we can do to get people interactive. Since the beginning, we've had chat rooms, using Twitter, using stuff like stuff like Tal, and so that's uh, kind of the new thing, especially with the wrestling guys. Um, and, uh, and just just finding where the people are at, you know? um, and it's different for everybody. Uh, like I'm finding, like like Facebook groups really work for some groups, but Twitter works for for uh, other things uh, as far as interactivity. And it really depends on your audience, um, and that's why I'm always kind of looking at these new tools. Like you know, I've been playing up here with Tout actually since the beginning uh, of the session, uh, and the bears and everything. Um, you know, stuff like that because I, I want to see what does that attract. You know, uh, what, what kind of audience does that attract? Like we're you know. We're seeing like the wrestling people are into it because that's what you know WWE's really pushing. Um, and uh, but then that doesn't necessarily work for my holistic, you know, mindfulness people out, out in uh, West Portland County. You know, so like that might their Twitter's dead, but I'm still getting some more interaction on Facebook. And I, I think Mike brings an inter- interesting point. Like on one hand. You want to experiment with stuff, but I think it's also overwhelming. Like I see a lot of businesses that are like, I don't really know what it is, but I, I just it's it's relatively inexpensive. I'm just going to go do it. So I'm gonna. Uh, I was just a meeting the other day, and they're like, we're going to create a Pinterest page, and I was like, I don't really see based on what you guys talk about, like how that's even going to fit. But because they're not really familiar with it, and then they feel like they need to be there because that's or like QR codes. Like I, I rail against QR codes, and no offense if people love QR codes, but but I, I we, don't. We just railed against it on the show. Yeah, and, and, and so it's funny where people will be like, I was, I, I just listened to a speaker, and he's like, all these businesses should use QR codes, and you should put it on your business card. And I was like, I think that's horrible advice. But yeah, that's my opinion, and it's probably right. My question for that is, have you used a QR code recently? I've never used the QR exactly. Um, so it's not on my business card. But also, if it's on my business card, like you're probably sitting with your, my business card anyway. So how much time are you saving versus just typing in my website URL? So, but anyway, not to get controversial, but a lot of uh, maybe you have like arthritis in your finger, and you, that's you, easier. Than if you have arthritis on your in your fingers, you may do you have a smartphone? I don't know, but. Um, <laughs> So, so probably my, my sweet spot's blogging. I, I started blogging uh, accidentally, inadvertently. With um, I, I'd written a book that came out in 2007. I had no interest in uh, I, Facebook was just sort of starting out. Twitter was just starting out. And it, I always use the Ron Burgundy joke about jogging because I just had a website built to promote my book. And then this other author goes, you should really think about blogging. And I was like, what? What, you, what do you mean? You just sit there and type? Like, what is the, is the, is the B side? Like, I, I don't understand this concept. <laughs> So I just started doing it anyway, and um, some might think that I still don't know what I'm doing if you're reading my blog today. Um, but we started shopping articles around sort of like what Deanna does to get my name out there so I could sell books. And one of the places we shopped the article to was uh, Fast Company. And they, at that point, which is which is pretty common now, but in 2007, nobody really had, no news outlets had bloggers. Like, so CNN didn't have blogs, right? Uh, now Huffington Post is all pretty much, you know, user generated or blogger generated content. So, you know, I started in 2007 with Fast Company, and it's been super cool. I've probably, in five years, interviewed, you know, 300 CEOs and some of the coolest startups in, in the world. And that's something I wouldn't have been able to do. As interesting as I'd like to think that I am, I don't think I'd necessarily talk to these people um, if I didn't have that blog. So it, it's that's probably where I spend most of my time. Um, and then a lot of the stuff was just a byproduct. You know, I, I didn't really think that... Um, Facebook and stuff was, I, I always sort of looked at it to try to build my audience as a way to try to sell more books, and it sort of carried on as I started to work with small businesses. So, that's my my toolbox. Well, my toolbox is, um, I always think it's funny to say tool, um, but anyway, um, as I mentioned before, I'm in public relations, and um, I actually did pitch Sean last week about one of my new clients, so I wasted no time. Um, but yeah, my kind of sweet spot is in writing, but more for the digital age. So, you know, traditionally a PR professional talks to people in the media, you know, an editor at a newspaper, um, a producer at a TV station, and pitches your story, and that's it. But there's so many more opportunities for being in PR these days than there were 
probably 10, 20 years ago um, because of, you know, social media, because of online. So, for instance, I'm, I'm doing that traditional media relations, but I'm also, you know, shopping my clients around to guest posts on something like a Huffington Post or a Fast Company and talking about their perspective on a, on a topic that's trending in the news or that's interesting coming from a CEO's perspective at a startup and their philosophy on something. So that's a way to kind of get their name out. And with tools like Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook, they can tell their own story on their own channels in their own time. So it's sort of like they're putting that message out. And before, you really couldn't control it because it was up to the media to kind of position and write a story. But now it's helped because, you know, you can write your own story and put out your own messages on your on your network. You just have to be careful, though, because as we've seen with tons of examples recently, most recently it would probably be Chick-fil-A. That stuff can totally backfire. And those messages you're putting out, people just go to you and flock to you and, and they yell because they're not happy with what you're doing or what you're supporting. So it's sort of a two-way street and I'm sure you guys all know that. But um, but it's interesting and, you know, I've not been in this industry very long because I'm very young, but, you know, even in my six or so years out of school, I've seen this shift in PR and I'm continuing to see it. Um, so PR is just one of the things I do and I also help clients with, you know, PR strategy but also social media strategy. So, Instead of just tweeting for the sake of tweeting, you know, we really sit down and develop plans for them and talk about, you know, what you're trying to achieve, who you're trying to reach, what you're trying to say, and that type of thing. And, you know, it's so interesting, too, because social media has been around now for a bit, but it's still so new and people are still very unfamiliar. So it's kind of fun, you know, interacting with different levels of people who have different knowledge bases. And I think that's a great um place to talk about those different levels will be at pod camp this year and you know some people are very very beginner and some people are more advanced so i think we we're trying to kind of tailor it to new people but also there anybody because there's something for everybody at the event and and that's what i found just working in social media for the past few years oh that shut off Good job. <laughs> and I think I think Deanna's area is one of the most interesting because public relations, because I'm, I'm on the other side of it, right? And it's it's like for, for decades, people would just create these press releases about what they think is really interesting. And I'm, I'm the one receiving a lot of those, and I can tell you they're not that interesting. Like, at least for me, like, it's hard to, mm-hmm. like, we have this new cloud. We were joking about it before the session. We have this new cloud app, and it's going to be the greatest thing for small business accounting. Like, Somebody probably can write a great story about that, but that's hard for me to wrap my head around because people talk so much about the cloud. People talk so much about apps. So because now technology's made everybody so much more accessible, that's good in one hand, but I think it also makes it a lot harder to sort of stand out because it's like yeah, it's you, know, you can reach all these people. So so what she does is incredibly important because people are terrible at it. So that the strategy is yeah. really important. So. Yeah, and another thing, too, is we touched on this, but knowing your audience. And a lot of the companies that I work with, and probably Sean does, too, um, are startups. So they're very tech-focused and tech-jargony and tech-heavy. And I'm trying to wrap my head around what my client does because if I can't do it, how am I supposed to pitch it to somebody? So you have to sort of say, take a step back and say, who's reading this stuff? Are they going to understand what this stuff means? So you know, kind of tailoring it down. Would a third grader understand it? Or, you know, not maybe not third grader, but, you know, knowing that not everybody's versed in your company language and making it interesting enough so somebody who's maybe not in your industry would still find it appealing and understandable and maybe even relatable. So that's really important as well. Can you give me an example? Um, so I guess... My, one of the recent examples is, um, so the client that I pitched Sean for is a startup out of Kansas City, and, you know, they do mobile search, and they have a whole app that's devoted to mobile search, which isn't, you know, groundbreaking. There's tons of stuff out there, um, but they kind of take it so, you know, you search for a term, and they, they kind of skip the web results and go straight to the web page and then integrate it with social media, so you get, like, contacts behind your search. But right now, they're sort of in this phase where the app's not really ready to be shown to people. So my job is to kind of take a step back and introduce the CEO and his background. Instead of just kind of saying, here's the app, and nobody cares, it's more taking his approach. You know, he's based in Kansas City. 
and he's got a different approach to a startup than somebody say in Silicon Valley. So one of my pitching angles is talking about Kansas City versus Silicon Valley and how he's taking it slow and you know Silicon Valley is like rush 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 you got to do it quick or else you're losing traction. So that's sort of that idea. So you know talking about his philosophy and his approach maybe resonates not just with tech people but with anybody who's an entrepreneur starting their own business or just is interested in how startups work. So that's sort of an idea of what I'm working on currently, um, which some people, again, won't care about. That's that's the tough part. But at least I have platforms to talk about it, and maybe somebody over here isn't interested, but this guy over here is, and I found my niche over here. So you just have to kind of kind of play around and see what works and what doesn't, too. One, one of the examples I shared when I, last year at PodCamp, which I thought was really interesting, is Shopify. I don't know if you're familiar with Shopify, but they do e-commerce platform, an e-commerce platform for entrepreneurs, and they had an intern. So this is actually a really cool story of, you know, they they were a cool enough company that they actually let an intern pitch to me at Fast Company, which I don't care about, but that's sort of a probably a big deal, right? So she just reached out to me through LinkedIn and said, hey, I saw this post, which nobody does. The reason why press releases suck is because they're just like a, a, a broadcast, a generic thing. What, what's cool about email and Facebook and Twitter and all this stuff is you can you can reach out directly to me and say, hey, I saw this blog post that you've written, and it was about creating a culture of innovation using your workspace, which is about my design when they were still on the south side. And if you've ever been in their workspace, it was nuts, right? So I blogged about that in Fast Company. They saw that. This intern reached out and said, hey, we're, we're going to move to a new space, and we're growing. I'd love to get your thoughts. And I was like, all right, because nobody does that. I've been, I've been blogging for five years, and I've had... Six people reach out to me specifically in response to a blog just to talk. And you don't know where it's going to go. And most, a lot of times, some people won't respond to that. But I was like, oh, you never know. And so about 10 minutes into our discussion, she goes, oh, and we created this thing internally we call the unicorn. And I was like, what's that? The unicorn? Well, it's like Twitter. And then the, she told me about two minutes on the unicorn, and immediately I knew it was one of the coolest things that I would ever write about. Because they basically created something like Twitter that they used internally to collaborate with each other, they used it to communicate, and then eventually they made it a, they turned it into a tool to compensate their employees. And it was game-changing stuff. And I was talking to the CEO, and he goes, well, you know, not a lot of companies are going to be interested in this, and not, eh. And, it's, and I stopped him. I'm like, you have no idea how, how big this is. And as soon as the post ran, they started getting companies that wanted to buy from them, people that wanted to have them come and be a VIP speaker. So it was like one of those, like, I had no idea what we were going to talk about. It involved, you know, Twitter, but it was called Unicorn. But it was just a totally cool because she sent me an, an email through LinkedIn, and I responded. So it, it's still one of my favorite. And I, now I'm, I'm, I'm good friends with the folks at Shopify, and I, I usually talk to them all the time because so they're just a really cool tech company that does really cool stuff. So... I think that's the power of this stuff, right? And if they had just re- relied on a press release, eh. Mm-hmm. You know, so Deanna's pitch to me was to me. And that's what's cool about this technology. So, anyway, not to get all pr on you, but two things <laughs> I don't like are PR and, and QR code. It must be the abbreviations and the R or something. I don't know. <laughs> They're close to the alphabet. I don't know. Good question. Uh, I'm going to answer. Okay. I was going to say, I, I kind of use a lot of the social media just to kind of get myself out there for me to find jobs. And so I try to blog, tweet, you know, whatever about the work I do since I do a lot of video projects. Uh, I've had I've had contacts from videos I did, you know, talk about Wirecast, which is like a... Uh, uh, a tool I use for, for podcasting that's kind of like a it's kind of like a studio in your computer. It does all the graphics and multi cam switching and everything like that. Um, and, and I just started talking about that, talking about another one that I used before called once, and I started getting you know people asking asking advice on it and, and it starts getting my name out there, you know, and, and, or talking about other things that I'm working with. Uh, personally, that's a lot of things. That's my advertising. I don't really need to go out and put, get my name out there. Uh, when I quit my job and started decided to do this, uh, you know, full time, you know, basically someone's like, "Oh, you have time? You want to work on a project?" And everything's kind of grown out of that. I, I got a my one client, two clients I have today are because I have did a wrestling podcast, and I started shooting with them back in 2007. They grew and I took over production. But it's crazy, like how much strategy. So I was talking to the guy from Shopify, and I think a lot of us are just like, I'll write a post and I'll push it out there, and everybody will see it, and people will throw confetti and they'll retweet it and all this stuff. And he started to tell me like what he does to get 
so it's like not only what how he goes out and does his research about what he wants to write about. So with Kickstarter, about two months ago, Kickstarter was you know, right around when they were starting to talk about whether the government was going to regulate it and what is it and all that stuff. Um, and so he got to the point where he knew what he wanted to write about Kickstarter, but then he started identifying the influencers that were passionate about Kickstarter, and then he started to create this campaign where he'd start to create dialogue with them. So it wasn't just, I wrote a blog post and I think everybody's going to read it, I'm going to tweet it out. Like, he did some crazy stuff, and it was like, I think sometimes, even as much as I think about it, I forgot, like, there's a lot of strategy. The, the more people are on this stuff, the more strategy you need, the harder it is to stand out, and it's always changing. Like, Facebook's always messing with their algorithms. Twitter's changing stuff. So it's like, you always have to keep current. That's what's great about PodCamp. Is you can you can get all these these minds together around Pittsburgh and share. I mean, between Mike and Norm, like technologically, like so far beyond where I am, I just love sort of you know he t- half the stuff he talked about tonight. I have no idea what he's talking about. So for me, that so I got to make a bunch of notes and be like, all right, I got to look into this and this and this. But that's what's really cool about Podcamp is over two days you get exposed to all this cool stuff, and then you can go back to your job and, and kick ass. And, and, and I actually had a pretty good. I have a friend that, that says, oh, I don't know if I'm going to Podcamp. I've been there like you know almost since the beginning. I don't know, you know, it's all one on one or whatever. It's like, no, you go and, and, and talk with the people and bounce ideas off each other because nobody's doing everything right. Uh, it, it's getting together, you know, stuff like this, and, and you know, uh, we'll, we'll throw stuff at each other, and you know, it'll give me a new idea, new tools. I just met with, uh, you know, I think uh, Norm earlier this week and, and another friend, and, and I found new tools that are just completely changing, you know, the way I'm doing things and managing projects and managing the people I need to manage, you know, uh, you know, in, in social media and just, you know, just just day to day work. So, and then there's just the cool random stuff. Well, we were talking about a little bit before this, but. I don't know how I, I, it's been. Uh, I know I'm not a hipster, but like last last year at PodCamp, uh, yeah, surprise, uh, I wasn't wearing a, a wool cap. But uh, last year, uh, I sat in a session from Paul Rosenblatt. And Paul Rosenblatt is the vinyl record architect, and his session I was going to go after him. So his session was on turning your crazy into a blog or something. And so um, his whole session was about how he loves vinyl records, and it was awesome because like I. Somehow I forgot that I really like vinyl records, and like all these years had gone by, and I was like, "Wow, there's this whole thing that I used to like that I haven't thought about in a long time." So even though it had nothing to do with new technology or new media, it, it totally exposed me to this area that I haven't thought about in years. And tonight I have this growing vinyl collection, so it was sort of like one of my podcast moments um, that, that I think from last year was one of the coolest. And it was random that I just happened to have a session after his, and I sat in on his. And uh, and it opened this whole new door to a, a personal hobby that uh, that I love. So every year I get a new way to try to uh, attempt to do a monetization or blog a different way or reach out a different way, uh, and, and all that's improved my community building ever since. There was a question over here. So the question was, in company, so many people are curious about the bottom line and, you know, you're a social media manager and how do you prove value? Um, there, there are services out there. I mean, you know, one of the ones uh, that's a startup that I think is interesting is um, there, there are some companies now that I think the analytics are getting a lot clearer. Um, and, and so if you look at organizations like Argyle Social that do a multi-channel marketing approach, and for a monthly fee, you can go in and you can only automate, okay, I'm going to send my tweets to here and do this and that. But they're able to see, okay, we posted something on Facebook three months ago, and then three months later, this person went to our website and downloaded something, and you can start to, to make those connections. Um, I think that's, you know, I think it's, that's the next. I was just talking to a venture capital firm, and they were saying, even with mobile, like some of this is sort of the, 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 uh, the analytics, and, and it, I think it's getting better. It's definitely gotten better over last year. But that's and it, it depends on what your goals are. Like, I, you, if you guys have seen that commercial, which I'm going to rail on in a presentation tomorrow from One in One Media, where they say you just build a website, all your customers find you, you ride off into the sunset, and everything's great, and, and we'll do it to you, we'll do it for free. It's like bold. Like, you know, a lot of I, I've been blogging for five years, and it's definitely had its benefits. But if you look at how many calories I've earned blogging versus how many clients I get, it's it's so so I think sometimes you have to be clear on the front end of what 
Are they doing it because they feel like they should be doing it? Or, you know, what's what's the motivation behind it? Is it brand awareness? Is it website traffic? Is it you know? And there's and then, you know, if there's there's a service out there called HubSpot, and they're cuckoo for cocoa puffs over landing pages and calls to action and blogging. So you know, if you create a customized landing page with a clear call to action, and you get people to do that stuff, you can you can start to see based on those goals what people do that. And that's I think it's still sort of there, there are tools out there, but I think that's probably something that I think people are still trying to figure out. Other than there's any universally accepted, this is yeah. how we know this is worth our effort. I think it's finding use cases. Yeah. You know, I, I think I, I really think it is. It's just like, look, this person did this for their audience. It's not exactly what we're doing, but this is the kind of thing we can plan for. And, and uh, as far as the success for it, I mean, that's kind of you know seeing the numbers go up, seeing. See the interaction. For me, I look for the interactive. Say, look, people are coming back at us. You know, uh, I think the, the one group I work with is a very small group. I mean, they get probably 50 people through the door, and they're doing fine. You know, and we're only have maybe 100 people, 100 likes on Facebook, but that keeps growing, and people keep responding as we as we attempt to show them, hey, this is what we're doing. Um, yeah, and, and, and it kind of like, like I, I don't know. I'd like you to get your thoughts on this. I, I recently, uh, a few months ago, had a client, a, a potential client, company. They had some kind of screen, screen cream, uh, uh, like anti burn cream. Uh, I don't even know how they found me. And they're like from North Carolina, and they're like, yeah, we want to try to do Facebook, and we want to see our sales go up ten percent in three months. And I'm like. I can't promise you that. I can promise you people will know your products out there and have a chance to converse and give you a, a you know, place to get your message out directly to these people. I can't give you a clear number like that. It doesn't work that way, the way I use it at least. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think too, it's kind of like when advertising began and, and, you know, you're trying to figure out the ROI on a billboard. How many people saw that billboard and how many sales did that, you know, have? You can't put a number on it, but I think what Sean said too is really important and it's setting measurable objectives from the beginning so you're not setting yourself up to fail and you're over-promising and you're not delivering because at the end of the day, if you can't show what you you know set out to do, then it doesn't make sense. But you could say, hey, we want to prove, you know, we want to get X amount of likes if likes is important, which I don't even think that's even a factor anymore. But, you know, say you have an app, maybe it's downloads, maybe it's that interaction that Mike was talking about, you know, we have to figure out what you want to get out of it and then tell whoever needs to be told that, you know, set those objectives with them and then go back and and show that. And I think analytics are really important and, and there's not one tool out there, you know, I've used Radiant 6 and Facebook Insights and all these other things and and there's tools out now um, that are kind of measuring people's reaction or thoughts behind not even just products but you know things in general maybe it's your category or your industry and you know there's like um, visible technology is one of the, the examples and you know kind of figuring out what are consumers saying in general and how can we tailor it and I think kind of Having that unique aspect that's uh, relatable to everybody, like I touched on before, is important too. Did anybody see what Grey Poupon did today on their Facebook page? I know you did. <laughs> I was all over it. So Grey Poupon is doing something amazing. So if you've been a community manager for a brand that's consumer-facing, you know that people are annoying um, on Facebook in, in particular. I managed um, a CPG brand's Facebook account at the beginning of this year, an ice cream brand, and every day, where's the coupons? That's all people cared about. I'm like, I don't have coupons for you. Go elsewhere. This is like $6 ice cream. Go buy some generic stuff and leave me alone. So Grey Poupon, there was a New York Times article on it today. Um, If you guys recall, back in the 80s, they had their big campaign where the two guys in the Rolls Royces, you know, roll down the window, do you have any great coupon, but of course, um, which was like an iconic campaign from Great Poupon back in the day, and they've been quiet for a while. So now they're back on Facebook, and they're doing a thing where they actually mine your profile to see if you're worthy enough of being their fan, which is awesome. So they look today, I, ha- I went through it, they went through my pictures, they went through how many friends I have, 
what I'm posting about and I was in like the 89th percentile so I made the cut but it's just so funny and they're actually going by grammatical errors of fans because so many people cannot talk but they'll go on Facebook and complain all day I don't know what they do all day but it's just comical because they're kind of kind of rubbing it in your face almost but in a not so in your face way if that makes sense so I just think that kind of thing is really cool and Oreo is another great example of course I'm giving you guys these high profile brand examples but you know you just have to figure out how your brand can adapt like that um, and Oreo does really cool things and sometimes they get bashed for it I know they had a rainbow Oreo that got criticism um, from some people and praise from others so you know they were just doing what they believed in and they're a fun company and they're trying to you know capitalize on trends going on and memes and all this stuff so and and you know what they own it and they're they're not afraid to put stuff out there that they believe in so I think doing things that these brands are doing and kind of not imitating them but learning from them and how you can tailor it to whatever brands or companies or industries you're working on is really important and you know it's fun but to me, the good news is, I mean, I know companies are worried about ROI, but the good news is, from what I see, so many companies are so far away from that. Like, they're still in the blocking and tackling of, like, oh, we should update whatever we do regularly. Yeah. And then, like, like seriously, I they're write way about... way not there yet. Yeah, like, I write <laughs> about stuff. Like, you have no idea how hard it is for me to get, even when I blog about a company, and dance like a monkey. Like, I would just... I'll dance and dance and dance and I'll be so excited about a company I'll write something about it I'll share it with them and then like I have to pull it out of them to, to tweet it to put it on their Facebook page and it's like that that's the kind of stuff that I think the majority of businesses are still trying to figure out they're either afraid to comment or they don't care enough to comment or whatever um, and as a consumer and also as a writer I never thought it would be as hard as it is to get people to what, what you write about so it's and I'm not asking for coupons like I, my best example, I went to Penn Avenue Fish Company downtown. I loved it. I took a bunch of pictures. They probably thought I was crazy. I, they thought I was from Urban Spoon or something. I said no, but I ended up blogging about about how they have this really cool vibe. I shamelessly put it on their Facebook page for my personal blog, and I still have yet to get a comment at all. And it's it's like not that I was even looking for a comment, but I'm like, who does that? Like. Yes. So I will never go to Pet Avenue Fish <laughs> Company. I'll always come to this place. Anytime I'm in the area, I'm looking for fish. <laughs> so. Just for the of it. And you guys talk about like bigger companies, and, and that like, I, I work a lot with uh, nonprofits and see what they do. They, they, they're always well, one, they're always looking for money, so or, or whatever you know, people get involved, whatever it is. So they're always more than well enough if they have the Twitter already set up. Uh, they, it's it's out that day, you know. Now, the problem with nonprofits is a lot of times you don't have money, so that means you probably don't have a social media person and you might have thin staff, so then you're going to push it off to interns, which you might anyway. And then you have this, you never have this continuity because interns keep coming and going, coming and going, coming and going, so it's really hard to get to that voice and all that stuff. So that's the one thing that's like, oh, the intern's gone. Our blog hasn't been updated for six months, and it's like... Yeah, I see that sometimes with smaller companies, yeah, too. When, yeah. I, when I stepped into this one company, like they're like, yeah, we had a media person... Uh, Back in 2009, and, and I found <laughs> all this stuff. You know, I mean, it was no, no, not much for website, social media stuff going on. It was more existing because he had like a TV show on PCNC and everything, and like managing that kind of stuff and flyers and stuff. And I'm just like, I just like went, you know, you know, and I was the next guy that came along more or less. And, and if I leave, I don't know what they're going to do. But it, but it was cool. There's a there's a podcast uh, that the guy from Argyle Social does called Social Pros. And it was cool because they had the, the, the uh, social media person from McCormick and Schmidt's or whatever. And so they own all these different restaurants. They own Bubblegum Shrimp and they own McCormick and Schmidt. And they're all different. So one is sort of Bubblegum Shrimp and one is sort of Fancy Steak and one's a, And so they have all these I know chains. that girl that does social media. They're only like, their whole social media team two is like people. two people and they have a ridiculous She amount. manages, I think, 30 pages or 30 brands. Yeah. And they're all distinct, you know, but it's cool because they empower people, like, when, when they know people are good, they'll have the chef, you know, they, they're, not, they're not afraid, like, some companies are like, oh, we have to control this, like, it took me, Dell, I tried to get a quote from Dell, right, it took 24 hours, the question I asked was nothing, it wasn't like, tell me the difference between a Centrino processor, like, I was just like, they created this new pro program for entrepreneurs, and I was like, how do you see that helping whatever, 24 hours went by, 
and they, 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 they didn't get it cleared with their legal team or whatever. Missed offer, I couldn't use it. It was, and then they came back to me. I'm like, it's, it's like 36 hours later. The, the post is gone. You know, so it's, it's not getting so caught up. It's important to have you know rules and regulations, but you know. So what are the questions you guys, you guys have about bears, stuff bears? The Chick Fil A thing's hard, and I'm not going to get into both sides of it. Yeah. From a PR perspective, I think that they should have had some plans in place in terms of their messaging up front. I don't understand what happened, and then there was, you know, this thing that came out where they had a fake uh, woman defending them on their wall, but it turns out it was Chick Fil A and all this stuff, and. <laughs> You know, I just think that they should have had more media training for their CEO, and they should have, you know, been a little bit more well versed about what their messaging was to begin with. And like I mentioned with Oreo, you know, they own whatever they want. You know, that's fine. That's their value. You're entitled to your own thing. But if that's the case, then you know, make it clear and have one thing to go off of from the beginning, and that's it. So I think it's very important from any business, big or small. Um, no matter what you're selling, is to have messaging in place to begin with. Everybody knows what your kind of company mission is or vision um, and kind of do's and don'ts. And, you know, it's important, you know, in case there is a crisis, to have stuff in place. And so many people don't. And, you know, the chances of this stuff happening are pretty slim, but as we're seeing with social media, the tiniest little thing can blow up and then you're screwed and then you're like, oh, no, what do I do? Chick-fil-A, um, I noticed... They're still posting and people are still talking to them negatively. They're just ignoring it at this point, which I think is a good idea. Um, I was actually talking to the social media manager of Applebee's. And there's this group of, I don't know if they're teenagers or what, but they just keep posting on like Walmart's page, Applebee's pages. They're just like, hey, what's up? How's it going? You know, like kind of weird stuff. Again, it's people with no life, but none of the other brands my name tag fell off. None of the other brands responded, but this woman from Applebee's started just chatting with them. Um, for example, it, it's so funny. She calls herself the Applebee's response guy, ARG, and she signs off her, her Facebook stuff with that. And she just interacts with them, and it's just so funny. They'll make her drawings and all this stuff. It's a woman, but they think it's a guy. Um, and one person wrote SUP, like S-U-P, and she wrote SUP back. You know, it's kind of, you know, you're... You're tailoring yourself to your audience. And some posts you get are weird or inappropriate. Obviously, you're not going to respond to that. But the way she's just interacting with them very casually is really cool to see. And if you go down their Facebook page and just read the responses, it's actually pretty good. So, you know, you just kind of have to find what is your company and, and keep that consistent. You know, you might have 20 different interns. You know, you need to devote it to one person and have one voice and, and kind of one protocol. I, I, the, the one thing I'd say is there are certain industries that I'd say just don't work in social media. Like if, if you, because I don't know how you handle it. Like I, I was at the uh, Entrepreneurs Growth Conference at Duquesne, and Bob Stein from Pitt was showing U.S. Airways, and on their like U.S. Airways has a Facebook page, which I don't know if they should or they shouldn't. Um, but everybody's angry. Like like <laughs> so what what's that engagement right? And so and, and not only the end. But they're, they're, it's, it's like some, some terrible video game where it's just negative comment, negative comment, negative comment. And then they do the, uh, we, we're not going to respond. So it's sort of like the double whammy, like you're giving people a clearing house. And I don't know what you could respond with because it's, you know, our prices are going up. We're going to shrink your seat size. We're going to cancel some flights. We may give you a hotel. Uh, so I don't know how you have fun with that. But, but I think the key takeaway is I'm sure even with like an Oreo or something, you know, as cautious as some of these companies are, you don't know, so you have to be sort of responsive, so that if things go, things can go haywire, and when they do, you just have to have the infrastructure because you're never going to be able to predict what people are passionate about. Like it is weird, like you post stuff, and people can go off the handle about nothing, and so yeah. what do you what do you do about that? Yeah. Sometimes people have fun with it. You know, the Chick Fil A thing, it did sort of, you know, go away because I think it, it sort of codified the country based on your either or with them or against them, and then so then they yeah. had. Now people are fixated on the election, so they can go 
you know, I yeah. think they kind of lost steam. He, he talked to one invisible chair, <laughs> and things got And that, that's what people go to. But the chair wasn't invisible. It's an invisible person. Whatever. But yeah, I think that, that yeah, too is just there. responding and, you know, acknowledging it, owning up to mistakes, too, is important. You know, we're all people behind these screens and whatever. There's somebody there, so... People seem so surprised when a company responds to them of any size, really. Like, like a, a few things, a few things I was handling, I'll, I'll get a complaint, or just somebody, you know, just somebody like you know, bitching on a board or something, and I'll respond to them, and they're like, "Oh, there's a real person that's listening," you know, and they'll say, "Oh no, I was bad," da, 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 and they'll start kind of explaining themselves away, which and people are used to going on the internet, going on Twitter, uh, going on on message boards, and just just tearing into like the American Airlines. They're not responding to that, so people just think that's the place to bet on it. Maybe please somebody listen to me. <laughs> and even if somebody who starts responding a little bit, it's probably way too far gone at this point. Yeah. That's a problem. They should have been doing this when that first started hit. But I don't get to get a lot of complaints. What are we going to do about this? How are we going to respond? We do have to say something, acknowledge it. You know, say, I understand. Again, I don't know what kind of response. I don't fly or anything like that. But, uh, but you know, look what happened with Com- Comcast Cares. I'm very impressed with stuff like Verizon, where I'll start, I'll start saying, hey, I'm having a problem with my thing. I think I ended up, Verizon responded to me. I ended up calling them and had a great customer service experience. Yep. Um, do you notice that there are companies that are in the total opposite of the sort of Southwest, right? Like yeah, you would yeah, expect yeah. U.S. Airways to be U.S. And that, so when they were talking about U.S. Airways, I was thinking, I wonder how Southwest, what they do. Southwest because, is phenomenal. Hilton Properties, Hold um, On, <laughs> But that's... Verizon, Verizon Wireless is great. Verizon is well, I, I deal mostly with their bio side, but yeah, um, yeah, they're, they're pretty tremendous. But a lot of times I'm just like, just be like, hey, uh, you know, talking about my host or like my host was down or anything. and it's a, it's a screw call surpass out of uh, out of uh, uh, Florida GoDaddy never responds to me when I'm bitching about them on Twitter you know I'm sure they got a lot or yesterday, yesterday. Or one day, of course but uh, you know but I mean in general um, but, they're, but I don't know GoDaddy's customer service has been great for me so other than that but these guys in Florida or like Backblaze which is a backup thing again smaller companies but they're very they, they want to get but, but I reached out and real quick if you saw the Honesty campaign which I think was freaking brilliant where they did the most honest, honest city in America and they put these iced tea kiosks in towns and you could just leave whatever money and so they and they filmed you and so some people would leave the money some people just bogart the iced tea and so it's all and then they created an honesty index and it was just a brilliantly executed they used YouTube it was a great campaign um, but I was writing a blog for my personal site and I reached out to honesty and they're I think now Coke owns at least part of them and uh, I reached out to their PR people and like an hour later I was like hey can I use some images do you have any images from this thing because they did like a, an overview of the most honest cities and spotted within an hour I didn't know what to do I, 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 and then they probably think I'm weird because like you don't understand how awesome this is like you guys are phenomenal and they're probably like alright weirdo but it's like that never it doesn't happen as much yeah. as it should so question back here Norm What's working for you? Well, I don't know. We kind of just threw the glass and everything. Facebook, you know, Facebook, Facebook's working better than Twitter. Nobody seems to want to really act on Twitter. But Facebook, at least we get an action. LinkedIn, but LinkedIn is okay. Well, you've got your website. But that, that'd be, it, it depends on what you're doing. Like, do you want discussions? Do you want to, like, an event like this? Do you want to put pictures out there? Like, what, you know, what, what's, um, what are, what are people reacting to? And I think so much of what you guys do is um, anytime you can put those visuals in, I, mean, I, I think that's one of the drawbacks still with Twitter. Is it's like, 
you know, although I, I did want to mention a guy called me out speaking of the, the weird stuff that happens. Like, I had a typo in a blog title, and I'm like looking at this guy's like, uh, I think you're missing the do. And then I was like, I was missing the do. And then I said, Well, the do is silent. And he's like, It's also invisible. And I was like, This dude's like the grammar police. He's like calling me out. Um, but but I, I'd say, like, number one, don't feel like you have to do everything. Like I said, it, it's if, if you don't need a Pinterest page, don't create a Pinterest page. Um, you know, yeah. if, if Facebook's working, you know, and, and, and uh, the LinkedIn groups are working. That's a question. Yeah. Is there a point where if you overpost them, but they spam you or something like that, they can call out if somehow it works? Or I think you'd have to post a lot to get the spam. Okay. Someone's yeah. saying if you do a lot, then mm-hmm. and it, well, it, it doesn't teach you to do a collab or something. Like, it takes away your new I don't know. I know Huffington Post is in my news feed nonstop, and they're still out there, so I don't know. I think it. Nobody realizes what the algorithm is, and although yeah. although there isn't there isn't uh, recently, there's a good Argyle has it because they do a lot of content generation. And I like it when they just updated Edge Rank, and I don't know if they've done it since. They did a really good webinar about like you know now for, you know. Six months ago, you didn't see as many images as you do now, and then you started to see where people, you could just put a quote, like these quotes on the walls around here, and if you just put that as a status update, you'll get like three likes, four likes, whatever, but you smash that over that picture of that giant fish, <laughs> and people are going to go nuts. Like, like it's, So people would just take like stuff Visual. like this, these poorly, like a, a weird looking post a note, and they put a quote on it, and then it would get like, so... You know, videos and it, what what Facebook really wants is engagement, and that's why when they look at top stories versus just your regular news feed, they're trying to think. And for them, it takes you more time to take a picture or a video than it does just type something, and it takes me more time to comment than it does to click the like. So, so even though the, these mysterious algorithms like Google search and all this stuff, you know, will never be able to completely de- decode. Um, you'll, you'll sort of see it. Like, you know, we're visual people. The funny thing for me is it took Facebook this long to have images. And now videos are the other thing that's sort of hanging out there, which I know is near and dear to your heart. But, like, videos are harder because we can quickly contextualize and categorize pictures. But videos, there's no real easy way to sort of... Uh, I was talking... There, I don't know if you have, anybody has the Show You app for your iPhone, but I was talking to the, the guy from there. And, you know, th- there really wasn't an easy way to categorize these things, to scan them really quickly, to get the context... And I think we're starting to see that now. So, you know, the, the, the algorithm, there's a, it's, um, Argyle Social has a, a really good webinar on, on Edge Rank that might be interesting um, about, you know, what, what they're looking at and it probably changed 10 minutes after, but I think there's still some truth to it. Any questions about stuff bears? Well, what do you think the stuff bear weighs? It's not that heavy. Surprisingly, not that heavy. <laughs> the base, the, all the weights in the base. <laughs> so, go
therapy groups kind of thing, and this is kind of the thing, kind of like you think Skype is. Um, and, and this is actually, let me start for that, because I actually have another person I'm working with that's doing, actually, and she just, I just got a text during this that she uh, launched her site today, uh, is doing Skype yoga and breaking down those barriers. Um, I think Hangout is the easiest thing to set up in comparison to like something like Skype. You get in, you get a, you get it, you get a, a plug-in, you have everybody along the, the bottom there, and then they have those on-air functions which will have, give you automatically a stream of video on YouTube, which is the place you want to be if you want to stream something, right? And automatically uh, they take that video and it puts it on your YouTube. You have content. Even if you, like, you know, do that, and you'll have, I don't know, you'll depend on your business. It's another way for you to bring customers in. You can do webinars with these things because you can just invite, like, you know, cut out a certain, like, circle uh, of people that, you know, however you contact these people or if you pay for it or something. Um, and just, I think the applications, like, are going to be really immense with this thing. I think, I think videos is interesting. Like, what, I don't know that we'll get another platform. Pinterest, like, Pinterest went nuts. Like, I, I thought we were saturated. We're like, all right, we had Facebook and Twitter, and you can see people were starting to slow down. And then Pinterest came, and it was the next. I, I, I was at the Entrepreneurs Growth Conference. Everybody should be on Pinterest. Everybody should do this. Yeah. And it's it, 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 well, it slowed. It slowed down. So yeah. I'm sure they'll continue to be one of the ones that I was curious about was Path. I think it was Path. Where they would limit your followers, so it's like yeah. instead of this, oh, yeah, I have five hundred thousand. It, it limits you to two hundred, two hundred fifty uh, friends total. Yeah, so it, you know, like, then how do we get back to sort of? This I have goal? way too many friends for that. Yeah, yeah. but <laughs> but I think, like, for me, I think what what what's going to be interesting is sort of not QR codes. It's I'm sure they'll continue to be more platforms. But I think it's going to be more, how do we blur the lines between our physical and virtual world? The reason why QR codes suck and, and, and this mobile device is great, but it still sucks, is because you have to, like, if I want to take a picture of the audience, I can pull up my phone, you guys think I'm weird, I'm taking a picture so I can go blog about it. There's still this clunky device, which is way better than the, what came before it. But in, in Alpha Lab, the demo day, they had a, a startup that's making, like, a wearable computer. And so you could, cops could have it, so it could have, instead of having the, the dash mount on camera, it could be in their badge. So I think like some of the stuff, if you're familiar with Deep Local in, in Pittsburgh, that they're doing stuff with augmented reality. So I, I think as business people, it's really curious, like how do we interact with the stuff without the mobile device? Like how do we blur that virtual? So, so I'm sure Google Plus is terrible. Google Hangouts is cool, but it, there's just no engagement. And, it's, and, and I think it'll survive because it's Google. But it's, if you're on there, like how much engagement do you get on Google versus Facebook? It's it's hard, and, and if you're and there's some people that do get some good traction, but it's it's uh, I think they waited too long. Facebook came out, and then so entrenched with some what is it a, a billion users, nine hundred million? Oh yeah, oh yeah. So, it, it, it's, it's growing, it's growing too slowly, especially for the business uh, side of things. Like we're just getting like functions on the business pages that like we really should have had like a year ago if they wanted to get any traction on it. So it'll continue to change, but I think it's more to me the exciting thing is not mobile apps because um, we're app saturated, but I think what's after apps? And, and I don't know what that is, but I think it's it's how we interface. It's not the, the doing. It's sort of, uh, it's, it's the uh, it's the crazy stuff they're doing at Carnegie Mellon where I don't need a keyboard anymore. I can just type on this, this yeah. splintery table. Um, yeah, I also keep an eye out on who's getting acquired by who is always something that's interesting. Um, I'm still waiting for Instagram to do something. It's been acquired by Facebook now for six months or so, so, you know, I kind of keep an eye on that. I know Hootsuite acquired some platform recently, so I kind of keep an eye on that. Seismic. So I kind of keep an eye on that because that backing and that those funds are really going to amplify what it can do, so that's always something that I'm interested to learn. And how to also merge it all together, you know, um, I think really like embedding things onto your website so people can see everything in one-stop shop is important. So a constant Instagram stream or a PDF of your latest presentation embedded via slide share, you know, a stream of tweets on the side, you know, it could be all crazy. But I think it's important to have something where everybody could see what you're doing in one place and whatever their preferred network is, they can reach you there. Um, and it's important not to be everywhere, but what's important to your brand or your audience. But I think that's also important to keep in mind. And I, and I Norm wants to pull the plug, but I'll say one more thing. Uh, if, if you want to see something, I think it's, it's also going to be about immersive experiences, exactly what she was saying. And I think if you look at AMC TV, like it's probably the best example. Like people are talking about interactive television. 
And for everybody, that means we're going to smash a uh, Twitter feed, which is like ridiculously like that. That's it. AMC has created like uh, Story Six, where you can watch the show online. You can sit there with your iPad. You can take short quizzes. You can learn more stuff. They have you know a, a comprehensive e-marketing campaign. Like they're doing some crazy, creative, immersive stuff around The Walking Dead and Breaking Bad. No other networks are doing it, but I think that's probably the best example of how everything's sort of integrated around one idea, and they're using all the latest technology to do some really cool stuff. WWE's been really good with that lately. They just released their uh, new app, and plus they were, you know, they bought, they actually have a stake in town. That's kind of how it got the, the attention of it. Um, and, and yeah, and, and you sit there on Monday Night Raw, and it's live, and you're getting the updates and, 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 and the tweets and everything, like all in one place. Um, and, and it's really integrated in the show now, too. So. What they call it, Raw Active? Or, uh, raw Active, yeah. Is that interactive? Yeah, yeah. So I actually had an article on Mashable yesterday about, of course, I don't know if you're, like, Jerry Waller had a heart attack during the show, like, in the last hour, so it was really weird. And, you know, half the people don't know if it's real and everything. So they, uh, they had a pretty good article uh, praising them for their social media work and just saying, hey, this is what's going on in the real emergency that came up in a fake sport. Was it about the Mermaid Show on the Discovery Channel? What's that? What they're talking about? The Mermaid Show? That was a hoax, so that was... Yeah, yeah. You thought there was a real mermaid, though, right? Somebody was looking I forward to that show, and I was like, here's the thing, it's 2012. If there were mermaids or Bigfoot... I still foot, believe. No, no, no. Wait, it would have been on It would have been on Facebook or something. It's, it's all a hoax. Uh, well, I think, I think Bigfoot is the perfect place to end. <laughs> <laughs> or Bob Ross, whatever you want to do. I got I'm doing so, a session about mermaids. Be there. Right. So, so here's the thing. So, so for us, for, as pod campers, right? Those of you who've been a pod camp before, you know this is where the conversation starts. We have a really good discussion, we answer some questions, get these guys Twitter accounts, ask them, you know, follow up with them, uh, make sure you get their business started before you leave. Because so that way, we do have questions like that. Okay, guys, we're open. This is why we do the pod camp. We love to talk about this stuff. They've probably been talking for another hour or there, right? But, um, but, you know, we have our time for the So, <laughs> thanks again for inviting PodCamp to be a part of Freedom Professional. We're honored to be here. Uh, again, PodCamp's on uh, October 27th, 28th this year. Uh, PodCampResearch.com is our website. Uh, PCPGH is our Twitter handle. And our hashtag for pretty much everything. <laughs> and uh, we're looking for uh, session speakers. So, if you have a session you'd like to give or a story you'd like to tell at PodCamp, uh, feel free to go to the website and submit your session idea. So fun who knows. Uh, registration open today. Uh, so yeah, yeah, looking forward to a really exciting event. Uh, and we're going to have a couple more high camp uh, themed events leading up to the, the October weekend that are kind of more formal settings like this. And so keep on our uh, Twitter blog for that. In my session. How about, yeah, if you want, it's kind of hard to hear. So if you want their Twitter feed to go up, yeah, we just want to call it a bump. And, uh, I got a bump. Yeah, so bump it up. Yeah, yeah, that works. Right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, guys.